Hello nature lovers and welcome to another exciting video in the environmental systems and society series. Today's is all about ecological pyramids, what they are and how they help us. So what are they? Well, they're really just simply models uh, that show us the different amount of stuff that's in an area, the number that's in an area, or the energy that's in an area. It's a way to organize that in an easy to read format. Okay, and I'm going to give you an example in just a second. So how do ecologists use them? Well, they, it lets them look and see how energy is transferred and lost. It helps them see what feeds on what and what organisms are actually found in different trophic levels. And it helps them to make sense of an ecosystem to see if it's actually still in balance. Okay, so for example, let's look at a food web. Yeah, it's very accurate as far as the relationships, but it is crazy to read. And it's really difficult to see what's in what trophic level. If you organize it in this, though, look, you can tell exactly where stuff is, how many there is of each type. It's much simpler. And so we break it down to three different types. We have a pyramid of numbers, which looks like this. It uh, gives us how many producers in an area. We have the pyramid of biomass, which shows us how much weight of each thing is in an area. And then energy, how much energy is in an area. And it could be any of these three kinds. So let's look more in depth at numbers. And really, we simply, we take a food chain and we say, okay, how many plants are there? How many herbivores are there? How many carnivores are there? And then we move up the chain and we organize that by number. And then we make this nice, easy to read pyramid. So we know exactly how many autotrophs, how many primary consumers, how many secondary consumers, and how many tertiary consumers. Now, it's important to remember this is an estimate, but it's an easier to read estimate, okay? So how we structure them? Well, we, we structure them like a food chain. We put the autotrophs at the bottom, and then as the trophic levels go up, that's how we organize all these pyramids. We go from autotrophs up to top consumer. Okay, so we in this picture, we start at the left and move to the right. And you can see that right here. So we've estimated with different techniques for estimating population size, which we'll get into soon. We estimate population size and we put all the producers on one level. We count them, we add them together, populations, put them there. Then we count all the primary consumer populations, add them together, put them there. Then we add all the secondary consumer populations and put them there. And it's not just in uh, grasshoppers and toads, it's all of them. So what do you do when there's fewer producers than primary consumers? And this happens often in lakes and so forth. So in this picture, the top is a normal one like I just described, but the bottom one's more in a lake where we actually have more zooplankton than phytoplankton. And it actually, we just make the phytoplankton square smaller. We accurately represent the number of phytoplankton organisms and there's less than zooplankton. That does happen. So what are the advantages? Well, it's a really quick and easy way to see how many of each kind there are. And it allows us to compare over time and see if anything's changing, if it's healthy, if it's imbalanced, which is great. What are disadvantages? And I would recommend pausing and writing some of this down. Disadvantages, that inverted pyramid confuse people. It doesn't allow for juvenile or immature forms. The numbers can be really big so it's hard to actually fit everything in especially at that autotroph level a lot of times we put a break in that bar like you would on a graph um and then where do you put omnivores it's just crazy so omnivores could be and well look at this see how big that producer square is compared to everything else it's probably accurate in showing the how much it takes to support the rest but it's a little confusing so what's a pyramid of biomass? Well, it really just shows how much mass is at, at each trophic level. So how much mass of autotrophs are there versus how much mass of herbivores? And how do we measure this biomass? Well, we have to dry it out. So we take an organism like kale and it's got a lot of water in it. We don't want to count that part. So we put it in the oven and we let it dry out. And then what we have left is the actual cell parts without the water. And that's our mass that we use to measure. And then we just add all the, the biomass up and we put it into the appropriate squares and voila, you've got it. So this is what it ends up looking like. For most of them, it looks like a pyramid. You can see those three on the right. But the one on the left, this English channel, that's that inverted that I was talking about with numbers. It also can happen with biomass. You have less biomass of producers than herbivores. Uh, herbivores. That's not usually the case, but it can happen. So the weird thing about this is, is this is both with numbers and with biomass, it's just a snapshot in time. So you might take it in the spring and see what it is. You might come back in the fall and do it and it's different or summer or winter and it's different. It might be different year to year. You can compare them to each other, which is a good thing. And it includes, biomass includes all the juveniles, which gets us past that one problem with numbers, but it's still, uh, it does have some disadvantages, which we'll talk about. So 
you only sample population size. You're not actually counting each one and adding it together. So it's accurate, but it's not real precise. Uh, it requires us to kill the organism, which sucks if you're the organism. The time of year can affect it. So, you know, if you look at in the summer, a tree is going to be super productive and have a lot of biomass. And you look at it in the winter, it's not. But algae that has the same amount of biomass, it might be more productive all year long. You don't know. Okay. It also allows us to come, uh, it, there's a little bit of, like you take a mouse, a mouse will store a lot of its energy in fat and it'll have a ton of energy. Whereas a snake might, that is about the same size, might actually store it in its uh, protein or carbohydrates and it won't be as much energy for as much mass. So that kind of throws some uh, productivity numbers off. And this is where we use a pyramid of productivity. And really what it does is this shows us how much energy exists at each trophic level in a given period of time and we look at this and this allows us to look at it over time okay and we use it we measure it in joules or kilocalories per area per unit time and so what's the advantage of these things well usually it's a pyramid for like a, what that we're used to if it's healthy it allows us to see how energy is transferred um, and it allows us to compare ecosystems. If you see this one, it tells us how much we have at each trophic level in a desert and we can compare that to another ecosystem. We can compare that to a deciduous forest and we can see exactly how much energy is available at each thing. We can calculate efficiency, we can calculate productivity, and we can see which one is a more productive ecosystem. So what are the disadvantages of this? Sounds pretty good. Well, it's, it's hard to calculate those things, as you guys know. But again, we have that same problem that we have most of them. Where do we put the omnivores? Black bears can be on any level in here, and that makes this whole thing confusing. Okay, that was a whirlwind tour of ecological pyramids. I hope it made sense. If it didn't, please let me know. Otherwise, peace out, homie. Wolf spider covered in her crawling babies. <laughs>